Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. In astronomy, this phrase is especially applicable. As a matter of fact, seeing can often be less important than understanding when it comes to the observation of objects in space. Oftentimes, we will only turn our best optical imaging telescopes and technologies towards something that we have already studied at length. In the past, this was because those technologies were expensive, inaccessible, and often unreliable. If billions were to be wasted, they should be wasted wisely. There is also the fact that under many conditions, it is difficult to actually see the object in question. Oumuamua, our first interstellar visitor, was too far away to get any highly detailed images. However, what happens when something is large enough to draw our attention via physics, but is so difficult to see that even our best optical telescopes, under the best possible conditions, struggle to see it? This is fairly common in astronomy. Often there are things whose presence we can infer mathematically, but which we are incapable of seeing. Neptune comes to mind, being discovered because astronomers observed its effect on Uranus. However, there are objects like this much closer to home than Neptune. In fact, they are orbiting the Earth. Beyond the orbit of our moon Luna are her two sisters, and they are larger and perhaps even older than she is. Your ears do not deceive you. The Earth has three moons. This is the story of the Kordyluski dust clouds. Everything in our solar system that has mass has an effect on everything else, the object having the greatest known effect obviously being the sun. Something smaller, such as the Earth, does affect the Sun as well, however, to a much smaller degree. The Earth, Mars, and even our solar system's giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are tossed casually to and fro by the mammoth gravitational power of our Sun. It is for this reason that astronomers observed that there were very specific points between the orbit of the Sun and each of the other planets at which even smaller objects, like moons and other satellites, could remain in orbit relatively undisturbed. These points were called Lagrangian points, and they are the result of physical gravitational interactions between bodies in a binary system. Lagrangian points were used to predict areas around planets where moons could be found. Naturally, our moon Luna is in a Lagrange point in the orbit of our planet. However, in 1951, a professor named Joseph Witkowski observed that there were more Lagrange points surrounding the Earth. Therefore, he predicted that these spots could be home to more moons though they would not be like Luna. These satellites, he predicted, were more like debris belts than traditional moons, made up of debris from sources untold. The largest of masses in these extra satellite fields was likely to be too small to be seen from the Earth, and would require telescopes and highly ideal conditions in order to confirm. However, the idea caught on, and the search for Earth's mysterious hidden moons began. That year, an astronomer named Kasmierz Kordyluski began searching Lagrangian sites designated L4 and L5 using a 30cm refracting telescope. Kordyluski's searches were unsuccessful. At least, at first. In 1956, Professor Witkowski made a suggestion to Kordyluski that he stop looking for larger solid bodies and instead search for smaller material, specifically large patches of dust. Kordyluski clearly respected Witkowski's opinion and took this advice and began searching for patches of faint, luminous dust roughly 60 degrees before and behind the moon's position. That year, his search intensity was redoubled because he observed what he claimed to be the glow produced by the dust clouds, with the naked eye. Whether he truly caught a glimpse of the glow from the dust moons is subject to scrutiny. However, in 1961, Kordyluski was finally successful in capturing evidence that the large dust patches did in fact orbit the Earth. Over the period between March 6th and April 6th, 1961, Kordyluski took a series of images from a mountain in Poland called Kasproi Wierk. The images captured light reflecting off of the massive orbital dust clouds. They were subjected to tests of isodensitometry to determine how the mass of the dust moons was distributed. The dust moons of Earth were named after Kordyluski, and though there were many in the scientific community who did not accept Kordyluski's photos alone as empirical evidence to constitute proof, the clouds are still studied to this day. A great deal of research has been conducted into the clouds, as well as Lagrangian sites L4 and L5 over the years. Much of this research was inspired by raw astronomical curiosity, but there have also been plans to send satellites into orbit at the sites as it would take minimal fuel to keep them in orbit. 
There are plans to make the Lagrangian sites transfer stations on a hypothetical highway to Mars, and there is even a proposed plan to use the sites to store pollutants. In October of 2018, a team of Hungarian researchers attached a system of polarizing filters to the lens of the camera as well as a charge-coupled device, a highly sensitive instrument used to detect photons, at a private observatory in Hungary. Their area of interest was the L5 Lagrangian site, and their intent was to definitively prove or disprove the existence of the Kordilovsky clouds. These are the photos that were taken from the observatory. The team, led by Gabor Havarat, was able to rule out any interference or visual artifacts. Based on these images, it was finally confirmed that there are in fact clouds of reflective dust orbiting the Earth. The clouds are roughly the same distance away from the Earth as the Moon, about 250,000 miles away. They measure roughly 65,000 miles by 45,000 miles in area, which means that they are not only larger than the Moon, they are also larger than the Earth. The dust that makes up the clouds is roughly one micrometer across. But what are the Kordilovsky dust clouds? Where did they come from, and why are they orbiting the Earth? These questions, it turns out, are not so easy to answer. Again, in astronomy, seeing is not always the same as understanding. It turns out that the clouds are comprised of dust from events like the Torrid and Perseid meteor showers, asteroid and comet impacts, and numerous other interplanetary sources. The possibilities, it would seem, are endless. While there are larger clouds of dusty reflective material that can be observed in the solar system, these are usually in between planets. Thus, their orbits are less often disturbed. Their origins can be studied with more consistency. The Kordilovsky clouds, however, are highly unstable comparatively. Though it is possible that they have existed since the very beginning of the Earth-Moon binary, scientists believe that the particles making up the clouds are constantly changing. Comets, asteroids, and other natural processes perpetually add new material to the Kordilovsky clouds, while at the same time the delicate balance of the Lagrangian points around Earth is constantly expelling material from the clouds. This would seem to indicate that, though the clouds have likely existed since the formation of the moon, there is probably very little material from that time period left inside of them. The clouds are ancient, but at all times are in a state of rebirth. In theory, the Kordilovsky clouds could simultaneously contain impact ejecta from very new asteroid impacts on the moon, as well as ancient remnants of the formation of the moon. Could the clouds be remnants of the ring of debris that was created by the impact of that formation? If so, that could mean that there are still trace amounts of the original moon dust particles from when the moon was formed. However, they would assumedly be scattered throughout countless other types of interplanetary dust particles. The history of how the Earth came to be the Earth could be in the night sky, written in dust and in constant danger of being lost to cold, dark regions of the solar system. Though the clouds do not seem to be going anywhere, with every passing revolution of our moon, we run the risk of losing more data on the formation of the moon and the creation of the Earth-Moon binary that produced the only known life in the universe. Perhaps we should be treating the Kordilovsky dust clouds more like a museum piece and less like an interplanetary highway stop or a landfill. If we continue to litter the space around our planet with debris or deliberately fill it with toxic waste, we run the risk of losing the ancient knowledge that could be taught to us by the Kordilovsky dust clouds. As above, so below, it would seem. One would hope that interest in the L4 and L5 Lagrangian sites around the Earth would at least guarantee some security to the Kordilovsky clouds. However, with proposed plans to make them into stopping points on an interplanetary superhighway, and even crazier plans to make them into interplanetary trash dumps, one could be justified in feeling anxiety over the treatment of the clouds. Thankfully, these plans are purely hypothetical at the moment. However, there is a Tesla Roadster on its way to Mars, as a testament not only to the ingenuity of man, but also to his thoughtlessness. The space programs of the Earth would do well to remember to respect the Kordilovsky clouds, as they may contain a veritable tome of information on the formation of the Earth and the Earth-Moon binary that led to life. Our moon Luna is spectacular enough on its own, but with the discovery of her hidden ephemeral sisters, we could piece together a greater picture of how the Earth came to be than we have ever had before. The key to our past could be floating amongst the Kordilovsky dust clouds, and at any moment, without warning, 
it could be gone forever. If you liked this video and you'd like to support this channel, the best way to do so would be to subscribe or to support me via Patreon. The link should be on screen or in the description down below. Thank you for watching and listening.